Oh, the 80s and 90s. What a time it was to be alive. We had anything from Pogs, which actually originated in the 1920s in Hawaii, but made a huge comeback in the 1990s. We also had Game Boy Color, to Skippets, to terrifying Furbies that sometimes had a mind of their own. 90s nostalgia has been somewhat of a trend recently with Tamagotchis making a comeback. I have one and I am proud to announce that I kept it alive until it left planet Earth and went back to its home planet. Lisa Frank having collabs with brands such as Morphe and we even had Rugrats Reptar bars hit the shelves at one point. Not to mention just recently Steve from Blue's Clue sent all of us a very uplifting message. However, what I didn't know was that among these brands, Lisa Frank was not all rainbows and unicorns as her brand perceived. There was a darker side. This is the rise and fall of Lisa Frank, the woman behind the bright rainbow colors, tigers, unicorns, seals, and more. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi my name is Monica. I like to post anti-MLM, so that's anti-multi-level marketing, and some true crime content along with some, I guess you can say anti-scam. I've been kind of sprinkling that in here and there over the last few weeks, but in today's video I am bringing you a deep dive into something I never thought I would be deep diving into, and that is the world of Lisa Frank. So of course, just as a disclaimer, this video is for entertainment purposes only and just my opinions along with it's just based on the research that I have been able to do. I encourage everyone to do their own research. I wanted to give a big thank you to Mitchie84 for becoming a channel member. Thank you so much for supporting my channel a little bit extra and thank you so much to all of you guys who watch my videos here on YouTube and either support me, whether that be just by a view, a like, a dislike or comments. It's all very greatly appreciated here. The idea for this video actually came from a, another video that I was watching by Bailey Sarian. If you guys don't know Bailey Sarian, she is a true crime content creator and she now also has a podcast that's called Dark History, which I have been obsessed with. I love her new podcast. But I was listening in on the, I forget exactly which number it was, but it was a recent one. And she mentioned something about Lisa Frank not being the best company, I guess you can say. So I decided I wanted to look into it and I wanted to see what Bailey was talking about because I had never heard of anything being wrong with Lisa Frank. Well, there's a lot to dive into. So with that being said, this is going to be a two-part series. Part one is going to be about the beginnings of Lisa Frank along with the slow demise of the company. In addition to that, we'll cover the working environment while part two is going to be about the lawsuits along with collabs that Lisa Frank has done and some potential alleged scams. There's also another issue that I wanted to talk about, which was an influencer slash designer who felt as though she claimed that Lisa Frank had stolen an idea from her and that was the reason why she was being evicted out of her apartment. So if you guys know of that story, then yes, I will be covering that, but that's going to be in part two. I remember when I was younger, Lisa Frank was all the rage. <laughs> I only had a few things by Lisa Frank, but I knew of other girls in my school who had quite a number of things by Lisa Frank. It was almost as if, if, if you didn't have something by Lisa Frank, it was like an abomination. <laughs> it was unheard of to not have something by Lisa Frank. So I do remember her as being the bright colors and I'll, rem I'll always remember having this one folder. It was my favorite folder and it was Lisa Frank with two whales on the front of the folder. It was my favorite, especially because I believe that was around the time that Free Willy came out and Free Willy was one of my favorite movies as a kid. I have a lot of favorite movies, but Free Willy was one that I definitely had to rewind many, many, many times and rewatch it. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that my childhood has been ruined by learning more about the behind the scenes of Lisa Frank, which there is a really great article that was written by Jezebel, and I will leave that linked below that I got a lot of my information from. But, and, and, and like I said, I wouldn't say that my childhood was necessarily ruined, 
but knowing more and reading that article and it just it was very disappointing to hear that this is what happened to Lisa Frank. If you are looking for a really, really great deep dive into the world of Lisa Frank, I highly recommend checking out this content creator by the name of Kalita Rosita. She did an amazing job covering Lisa Frank, going over everything super, super, super in depth. So if you're looking for something that you can sit there and binge for hours, I highly recommend watching that channel. I'll leave the channel along with the videos linked in the description box below. In order to understand where everything went wrong, we have to start from the very beginning. So let's get into the rise and the fall of Lisa Frank. Lisa Frank was born on April 21st, 1955. Lisa Frank is not just a person, but the name of her brand. She graduated Cranbrook Kingswood School in 1972, which was located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which is a city just north of Detroit. From what I've gathered, Bloomfield Hills is a wealthy area to live in with a population of under 10,000 people. Her father was an art collector and was the one who introduced her to the world of art. However, interestingly enough, he did work in the automotive industry and ran Detroit Aluminum and Brass. This was a publicly traded family company founded by Lisa's grandfather and his brothers in 1925. Detroit Aluminum and Brass manufactured automatic transmission components, clutches, etc. They were the only company in the U.S. to make engine bearings for tanks used during World War II. Detroit actually used to be called Motor City because it was once home to Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, otherwise known as the Big Three back in the day. Unfortunately, the success of Motor City would not last forever and the decline of Detroit would inevitably happen. What I will say is that once Lisa developed an interest into art herself, her parents were supportive, which is not something that happens for everyone. Not to mention, her life was pretty comfortable due to her family being wealthy. Lisa told Urban Outfitters in an interview, quote, My dad was an art collector. My mom had a little kiln in our basement and we would make pottery. I think from about age five on, they sent me to art classes and I was a huge colorer. Huge. I think to keep me quiet, they would bring the coloring books and crayons and I would fill up the books. I was totally a girly girl. I was not a jock. When I was 12, my parents got me a loom, so I was a weaver. I love to read, I love to do artwork, I love to do anything girly, end quote. It's clear that her parents not only supported her love for art, but they encouraged it as well. Maybe in the beginning it was to keep their child busy because we know children can be rambunctious, but it seems as though in her later years that may not have been the case anymore and it was to encourage her abilities. Speaking of Lisa Frank's family wealth, she attended the same pre-K to grade 12 prep school as people such as Mitt and Anne Romney along with Selma Blair. Her senior year, she entered into an art show and somehow made $3,000 by selling her art. Keep in mind, this was in the early 70s, and judging by a few inflation calculators I used, it seems like in today's world, that would be about twenty dollars to $21,000. I'm very shocked by that amount. However, at the same time, if these calculators I used were correct, it would make sense due to one of the buyers being Lee Iacocca, who was the former president and CEO of Chrysler from the years 1978 to 1992. Fun fact, Lee participated in the design of the Ford Mustang and Pinto, amongst other cars, and it's been said that he convinced Henry Ford II to get back into racing. I'm not a fan of Ford, don't come for me, especially Mustangs, unless if we're talking about Eleanor from Gone in 60 Seconds, but I prefer Chevys because you can't beat that LS engine when it comes to American cars, but I am a huge fan of European cars. But regardless of my feelings towards Ford, it was the start of an era in the automotive industry. Thanks to that, Ford was able to claim wins at NASCAR and Le Mans in France, which going to Le Mans is a bucket list item for me. I'd choose that over NASCAR any day. Anyway, back to Lisa. She would go on to attend the University of Arizona. During her time there, she did something which I had no idea about. She would buy handmade pottery and jewelry from the local indigenous communities for a low price, then bring them back to Michigan and mark them up. Now, I understand that this is how it works with certain businesses where you purchase at a wholesale price and then mark it up to retail. 
However, in this situation, this isn't just any business. It's handmade items made by artists of the indigenous communities. Were they aware that Lisa was doing this or was she taking advantage of them? If there was some kind of contract, that would be a little different. I can't help but question, even if there was a contract, was it fair or were these indigenous people being taken advantage of? Because of this buying and selling at a marked up price, Lisa started doing very well for herself. So much so that she eventually started telling the artist what to make. I truly hope that these artists were properly, fairly, and ethically compensated, but I can't help but have a sneaking suspicion that they weren't. Once Lisa noticed that she had an entrepreneurial mindset, I guess is what we can call it, she started creating her own jewelry. This is where her plastic jewelry line, Sticky Fingers, was being sold at Neiman Marcus and Bloomingdale's. Lisa was just 20 at the time. I do wonder though if any of her success may have had to do with her family's wealth and large network. I'm not trying to say that she isn't talented or discredit the brand that she did build, but if she were just an average everyday person, would she have had the same opportunities? There are so many artists out there that I see on social media platforms and I wonder when they're going to get their big break because they're just incredible. It's kind of how Rachel Hollis decided to go on TikTok that one time and say that she worked her ass off to get to where she was, but also failed to acknowledge that her ex-husband was a Disney executive, which could have helped her situation just a teensy tiny bit. Note my sarcasm there. Of course, Rachel did have her own success, but would she have become a household name prior to problematic behavior if she didn't have the same connections? In Lisa's first wholesale business, she was able to get the rights to Betty Boop, Popeye, and Mighty Mouse from King Features, so she would mix them up. For example, she would put Betty Boop on a unicorn. In 1979 is when she renamed her company to Lisa Frank Incorporated, and the Lisa Frank that would blow up in the 80s and 90s was born. I make the coolest stickers. I should know, because I have most of them. There's all these folders and pens and backpacks and stationery and stickers. Of course, stickers. It's impossible to keep up with, but it's fun to try. Lisa Frank, you gotta have it. The day I got stuck on Lisa Frank. The stickers were so cool. The colors were awesome. I gotta find more. So I go to the store. And wow, there's tons of awesome Lisa Frank stuff. I gotta have it. What more can I say? Pretty soon my friends Ashley and Lindsay are going Lisa Frank crazy too. So now we always get together and have the dreamiest sleepover. The most outrageous party. And we join the one and only club, Lisa Frank. Now life's a total blast. Lisa Frank, you gotta have it. At just 25 years old, the same year she renamed the company, she landed her first million dollar order from Spencer Gifts. I don't know if Spencer still has the same popularity as it did when I was younger, probably not, but I remember going to the mall and always stopping in Spencer's. I was obsessed with covering all the walls in my room and posters and those glow in the dark stars that you would stick on the ceiling and Spencer's always had a bunch of those. Lisa Frank sold stickers, stationery, and other products that were brightly colored with unicorns, leopards, and other animals. When I was younger, if you didn't have Lisa Frank products, it was almost like an abomination. I didn't have too much Lisa Frank, but I knew of girls in school who literally had everything Lisa Frank. None of their trapper keepers, notebooks, folders, pencils, erasers, etc. were anything but Lisa Frank. What I will say though is if you go on the Lisa Frank website, they still have their original photos on there. I'm pretty sure one of the photos is Mila Kunis when she was really, really young. Even though Lisa had become a household name, she did like to stay somewhat private. There are only a handful of pictures and videos of her on the internet. She even asked Urban Outfitters in 2012 not to show her face when they filmed an interview with her. If you're wondering why Urban Outfitters filmed any kind of interview with her, it's because they did a collab with each other, which is something we will go over in part two. Due to Lisa wanting to keep a low profile, in the same year 2012 in an interview with The Daily, she said, quote, in my own little way, I understood Michael Jackson, end quote. I don't know how anyone can compare themselves to Michael Jackson or at least their level of fame to Michael, but Lisa did. She even mentioned in the interview that when she goes out and people see her name on her credit card when she checks out, people immediately ask if she's the Lisa Frank and she just shrugs it off as she happens to have the same name. I can respect her for wanting to keep herself and her life as private as possible, especially if your art is the focus of your brand, not you. There are some channels here on YouTube who never show their face so you have no idea who's behind the voice you hear and that's fine. 
But let's be real here, Michael Jackson was an entertainer. It would have been impossible for him to keep his life private. Yes, that's a form of art, but he's the king of pop for crying out loud. I don't think she can equate her fame to that of Michael Jackson. I'm not sure if she meant it to be as extreme as it came out or if she was just so full of herself when she said that. Maybe that was the first celebrity that popped into her mind during the interview, but I mean, she picked a hell of a celebrity to compare herself to. According to the Jezebel article that I'll be referencing a lot throughout this series, Lisa Frank was very focused on her appearance and always needed to be very thin. Judging by what some of her past employees were saying, it seems like she was or maybe still is, a little more than just focused on her appearance. It sounds like she was obsessed with her appearance. I genuinely hope that this isn't due to any other struggles or issues she may be dealing with, and if she ever needed professional help, she would seek out to get it. Her employees even noticed it. One former employee said, quote, well, she's getting older now. She kept getting, I don't know if it was plastic surgery, but she kept getting these lotions talking about youth. Have you met her? She's like two pounds, she said, adding, she just doesn't want to eat because she doesn't want to look fat or ugly or whatever she thinks, end quote. Let's move on to chat about Lisa's family. To give you a preface as to what kind of person Lisa's husband was, when former employees were interviewed by Jezebel and asked what the root of the problem was working at Lisa Frank along with according to court documents, they all had the same answer. It was due to James Green, Lisa's husband and CEO of the company at one point. There were rumors that James was unfaithful to Lisa in addition to having a problem with cocaine. Court documents did say that the marriage between Lisa and James started off as just personal drama but turned into a professional disaster. Once we go over lawsuits associated with Lisa Frank and Lisa Frank Incorporated, this will become very, very apparent. James started his time at Lisa Frank in 1982 as the company's first in-house illustrator and designer. Sometime in late 1983, early 1984, James started to have a romantic relationship with Lisa. He also started to climb the corporate ladder, and in 1988, he became an officer and was named president and CEO in December of 1992. This is just my personal opinion, but I can't help but question if James had an ulterior motive from the very beginning. James and Lisa could have very well had a great relationship, and it could have happened on accident, but there could also be a possibility that James wanted to climb that corporate ladder. This was in the very beginnings of the Lisa Frank brand, but maybe he saw potential and something for his own gain. Again, this is just my thought process. Anyway, the two would marry on October 22nd, 1994. The following July, at the age of 41, Lisa gave birth to their first son. She would have two sons named Forrest and Hunter. Yes, that would make their names Forrest Green and Hunter Green. The two children were named after two characters of Lisa's, a leopard cub and a tiger cub. Once her children were born, she wasn't really interested in being a businesswoman anymore. I'm assuming she just wanted to spend time with her children because she started working from home and rarely made an appearance at the office. One of the employees who was interviewed stated that Lisa would come into the office maybe about once a month just to pop in and see how things were going. At this point in Lisa's career, and at the time her products had peaked, she decided to hand over her duties to James. Lisa had been the sole shareholder in her company, but when she decided to step down, she gave James 49% of the shareholdings. For the next 10 years, James ran the company. According to a former employee by the name of Justin, he said that James, quote, really turned that place into a shit recently in a video, but I ended up cutting that bit out because it was associated with something else I was talking about, and unfortunately, the original thing I said was slightly incorrect, and my personal story wouldn't have made sense without that part that I was incorrect on. One of you had commented on that video and was working on very limited information, but you did form your own opinion regarding that very limited information because I only told a small sliver of the story. I have made a whole entire video dedicated to that job, but it was an abusive and toxic work environment. The turnover rate there is the worst I've ever seen. Maybe even worse than the MLM companies I speak about on this channel. Reading about James and Lisa, it sounds like a very light version of my past employers, which is why from experience, I can say an environment like that takes a toll on the employees. I'm not saying don't reprimand people when they do something wrong, because if someone does something wrong, they need to know so they don't do it again. 
but you don't need to publicly berate or verbally abuse them in the process. There's a difference between normal disciplinary action and flat out abuse. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. I wanted to talk about the work environment a little bit more and go over the problematic behavior displayed by James and Lisa. Caroline, who at one point wanted to apply to work for Lisa Frank Incorporated said, quote, Lisa Frank is notorious in Tucson as the world's shittiest employer. Every single person I talked to advised me to avoid Lisa Frank at all costs. I didn't know a single person who had not heard horror stories about the work environment there. I don't know if it's possible to really communicate how bad their reputation was in town. Every person who ever worked there seemed to have a case of PTSD from it. Rainbow Gulag is really an apt description, end quote. This was the general consensus of the town of Tucson and former employees. When you think of Lisa Frank, you think of a fun place to work with all of the colors, imagination, art, and sharing ideas with one another. However, for former employees, they stated that while they were at the office, it was to be silent and they were not allowed to speak to one another. Management even tapped into phone calls and illegally recorded them. There was a newsletter that would go out bi-monthly called Frankly Speaking, where employees were told how they were expected to behave within the company. There were new company policies coming out all the time, and with each policy, it just became more and more restrictive. If you violated any of the policies, you could endure verbal abuse, being publicly berated, automatic termination, or there could be even more policies and restrictions made that would be written about in Frankly Speaking. There was an incident that happened where an employee left 10 minutes early and James was so angry about this that he told the warehouse manager to put chains and padlocks on all of the downstairs doors. Yes, you heard that right, chains and padlocks. As if the environment wasn't bad enough, James made it seem more like a prison rather than a workplace. Marsha, who was a graphic designer at one point stated, quote, there was just this air of fear there. It just seemed very clear, the mentality of it. Keep it ice cold. Keep people miserable and on edge. It was just insane, totally insane, end quote. The environment wasn't just terrible at Lisa Frank Incorporated, but if you decided you wanted to leave, that was a completely different story. It's been alleged that if you decided to leave, you may not have been given the severance package you were promised. In addition, the company would fight unemployment benefits and it got to the point where some former employees had to sue them to receive their final paychecks or commissions. Employees weren't the only ones who were dealing with this kind of nonsense. Local contractors and builders claimed that they hadn't been paid for $4 million worth of work on the Lisa Frank building in Tucson. Lisa Frank Incorporated was a revolving door. I know that I talked a lot about James's attitude towards the employees, which there's even more to get into about that, but Lisa was no angel. One person said, quote, I personally heard Lisa scream at sales managers and threaten their lives if they fucked up a presentation, end quote. Another person said, quote, every day was so stressful and hearing Lisa's voice downstairs on a speakerphone made my blood run cold. I had many instances where she abused me verbally, end quote. A former employee said that they had run into Lisa outside of work and the person said, quote, oh, Lisa, remember me? I worked for you. And she said, oh, did we fire you? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't really a great employer, end quote. Whether or not this particular conversation happened, I'm not sure. This is only being told from one side and I haven't seen Lisa deny or confirm this conversation. If it did in fact happen and Lisa acknowledged that she was a terrible employer, then I'll give her some kind of props for that. It doesn't excuse or change anything that Lisa has done in the past though. I know I've already gone over James a little bit, but he only gets worse in this story. Here are just a few things that former employees had to say about him. Quote, James's management style is abrasive and he often leads by intimidation. He is often abusive to some of his employees by his language and actions. He will never take someone to the side if he has an issue with them. Instead, he will scream and curse and belittle them in front of everyone. Whenever he hasn't liked someone or they have crossed him in some way, he makes their work life miserable by his constant abusive comments and harassment." End quote. James wouldn't learn employees' names, so instead he would give them nicknames. Well, from the sounds of it, James was pulling a Michael Scott from the office. I don't know if some of you remember the episode where Michael and Pam go to Holly's branch to give a presentation and Michael starts giving people nicknames and they're not exactly the nicest and some are actually kind of offensive. Well, there were
there was one woman who, according to a former employee at Lisa Frank Incorporated, was not the most attractive, and she was referred to as that guy by James. What a downright asshole. Some said he may have had the Napoleon complex. One person even said, quote, people who work directly with James couldn't wear heels. He said it was because they couldn't walk fast enough to keep up with him. In reality, he has short man syndrome and didn't like working with women taller than him, end quote. And might I add that there are some women who can actually walk faster in heels than they can in regular shoes. I am actually one of them. I don't wear heels all that often because I am 5'9", so I'm very, very tall, but... Yeah, it, that, that whole explanation that James had is just a bunch of bullshit. Well, now we're going to introduce Rhonda Rowlett, who had been with Lisa Frank Incorporated since 1984 and became the company's vice president. It was said that James was a tool and Rhonda was his hammer. Or as one former employee put is, she was a Darth Vader to James's emperor. Dan Mullen, who had been with the company for 14 years, said in court documents that Rhonda was the enforcer. James used her to maintain control of the employees. Apparently, employees were constantly being called to her office for her to only threaten and harass them. However, even Rhonda wasn't immune to James's abuse. The following is going to be pure speculation on the part of former employees because I have not seen concrete evidence of this, but it has been spoken about by numerous employees, so I thought it was at least worth mentioning in this video. With that said, take this with a grain of salt. A lot of former employees thought this behavior from James and even Rhonda was due to an addiction. The two of them allegedly were pretty big into coke, according to a former employee named Kyle. There was another former employee who said the following about a conversation they had with someone. Quote, she told me that James regularly sent her with an unmarked box or a paper bag to meet someone at a gas station or parking lot. She was supposed to exchange her package for theirs and not look inside. There was a lot of rumors and a couple of incidents about their cocaine use, so we can guess what was inside. He also had her buy his Viagra and his porn, end quote. Which, in my opinion, is pretty messed up if James had this employee going to pick up his substances because what if she would have been stopped by an officer? Or what if she could have been arrested? She had no idea what was... I mean, she claims that she thinks she knew what was in the bags, but she was told not to look in the bag. So it, it's just, it's so messed up that if this is true, and if James really was telling one of his employees to go pick up his illegal substances, that's really messed up. Like super messed up, it just bad. But anyway, Kyle said, quote, I think Lisa Frank was into a little bit of Coke or something as well, end quote. This was due to some kind of letter that was on the back of one of the original artwork pieces in the archive room. It was from a friend of Lisa's where she talked about how much fun she had freebasing and whoring around New York with Lisa. One employee said, quote, I think we all Xerox that, end quote, which I haven't heard someone say Xeroxed that in such a long time. There were rumors going around saying that Rhonda and James were having an affair. I wouldn't doubt that, judging by what I've learned so far about James. Well, in July of 2005, James moved out of his and Lisa's family home, and come September of 2005, Lisa filed for divorce. During the summer of 2005, Lisa started to get more involved with the day-to-day -day at Lisa Frank Incorporated. In my opinion, I think she was trying to salvage whatever was left of the company. At the time, though, James was still CEO and Rhonda was still VP, so it turned messy really quickly. All of a sudden, James and Rhonda started telling the employees of Lisa Frank Incorporated that they needed to pick a side, James or Lisa. Let's just put it this way. It got ugly. There was spying on each other and employees via email monitoring, and it got to the point where a judge ordered James to return six computers that he stole from the company. These computers apparently, according to him, contained some kind of personal correspondences, which is why he stole them. Lisa filed a civil suit and an application for a temporary restraining order against James. This was due to Lisa wanting to elect a new board of directors, and she wanted to keep James away from the business so he wouldn't harass employees and sabotage Lisa Frank Incorporated. Lisa became the CEO of Lisa Frank Incorporated again, while James, Rhonda, and Rhonda's secretary were escorted by the police out of the building. Lisa had only won this battle, and she would have to prepare for the war that was ahead, which we will go more in depth in part two. 
Spoiler, there were a lot of back and forth and a lot of lawsuits. In the late 90s, Lisa Frank had truly hit its peak. They had made over $60 million a year in sales. According to court documents, the shareholder distributions between Lisa and James totaled over $100 million between 1995 and 2005. However, by 2013, the company earned $2.3 million in annual revenue, which is a lot to the average person, but can you imagine that kind of drop as a business owner within less than a decade? Their retail stores also started to tank. At one point, Lisa Frank Incorporated had 350 employees, and by 2013, it was said that they were at just six. Since then, the Lisa Frank manufacturing plant has been abandoned. This building is 320,000 square feet and was known for all of the Lisa Frank decor and statues. It's pretty much what you would have expected Lisa Frank headquarters to look like. At the time of filming this, according to Dun & Bradstreet, Lisa Frank Incorporated has a total of 20 employees across all of its locations and generates 5.71 million in sales. However, their LinkedIn shows that they have 33 employees that are on LinkedIn, but that can also be inaccurate if someone doesn't use LinkedIn or they haven't updated it and they're still showing that they're working at Lisa Frank when they're really not. From my research, it seems like Lisa Frank doesn't manufacture her own products anymore, but she contracts someone else to do it for her. Former employees said that Lisa Frank could have easily capitalized off of 90s nostalgia. I mean, so many companies have done that. Like I said, just recently, Steve from Blue's Clues addressed all of us for the 25th anniversary of Blue's Clues, and the Empire State Building even lit up blue for the occasion. While Lisa Frank did have some collabs, which we will go over in part two, it wasn't enough to truly save her brand. According to Jacob, a former illustrator for Lisa Frank Incorporated, quote, they could have caught on with the hipster market, but in order for a company to really turn a corner in those kinds of things, they need compassionate leadership and people who appreciate and can nurture talent. They didn't have either of those, end quote. Jacob was referring to Lisa and James when he said that. Another employee who was kept anonymous and had a fake name throughout their interview stated, quote, I don't think Lisa and James have a lot of business acumen. I don't think they ever did. I think Lisa's parents funded the start of her company. She's an artist, not a business person, end quote. A lot of former employees thought the demise of Lisa Frank Incorporated had nothing to do with business and everything to do with the personal drama and nonsense that went on behind the scenes. That proved to haunt Lisa for quite some time when it came to lawsuits. Which is where we are going to end part one because we will pick up with the lawsuits in part two. I know that Lisa was no angel judging by former employees and what they had to say about her, but I do, in a sense, kind of feel bad for her. And again, I know that, it, that this was a team effort between Lisa and James and then the third wheel who was Rhonda eventually but I, I do kind of feel bad for her because Lisa wanted to step back from the company to take care of her children. And in my opinion, James and Rhonda kind of ran Lisa Frank Incorporated into the ground. Now, that's not an excuse for Lisa. I'm not trying to place her as a victim in all of this. And I'm not trying to say that she didn't do anything wrong. But in my opinion, it seems like she just wanted to be an artist. She's not meant to do the business side of things. And James was supposed to do the business side of things, but he did a terrible job at it. But Lisa is also to blame for how her employees were treated because if that conversation that happened with that one former employee where she said that she wasn't a very good, that Lisa said herself that she wasn't a good employer, if that conversation did happen, she was aware of what was going on. She was also aware of what was going on because her and James had issues while they were at the office. This creates a toxic work environment. And so she is to blame for that. So that is all that I have for part one of this series. Part two will hopefully be coming out soon, I'm, I'm hoping. But for all of you who were here last year for my Spooktober true crime series, I am doing that again this year. I have a few things planned out. I'm hoping that I can get everything done and filmed because as you guys know, I am due in the month of October, towards the end of October. So I'm hoping that I can get everything kind of out because I am still physically working at our business. I'm not home yet, but we did, in case you guys didn't notice, we did move 
me into our bedroom. So I have my own little office set up here. The YouTube room that we just started in January and never finished actually <laughs> was or is now being turned into the nursery. So that is why I'm here in our bedroom until we can find another spot for me. I know that I've had, when I have filmed in my bedroom before a few times, and I know that this is like housekeeping stuff that has nothing to do with the video, but I figured I would add this at the end in case anyone was wondering. I, I've had people say that the, the bathroom, they don't like it that the door's open, but I'm really sorry. You guys are gonna have to deal with that because there's no door. This house was built in the 80s, and I guess in the 80s here in Florida, that was like a thing. <laughs> I don't know if it was a trend or what it was, but so there's no door. It's just, that's a hole in the wall pretty much for the walkway, and there's nothing there. So if it does bother you guys too much, maybe I'll come up with an idea for curtains or something but I'd really prefer to not drill holes in the wall because we don't plan on staying here for that much longer and crossing our fingers at least another year and we just don't want to have to redo all that because we are renting this house and we are looking into buying our first home so I'd rather not put holes in the wall if we don't have to so I'm hoping that you guys can just kind of deal with that <laughs> but anyway I think I got all of the housekeeping stuff out of the way and yeah so you guys let me know what you thought of this video so far part two will be coming out soon hopefully hopefully next week I'm hoping <laughs> because I have to do I have to finish the I have to finish part two and then I also have to start doing my spooktober series so it's gonna be a little hectic in the month of October plus having the the baby coming and everything so okay i've rambled thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys next time this is monica reporting to you live from a highway bye